we're going to go into the word from here. Let's let's quickly let's start with with um, Psalm 139. Thank you, Jesus. Psalm 139. All right. O oh Lord, you have searched me thoroughly and you've known me. You know my downsitting and my uprising. I want you to, to hear this. This is you you understand my thoughts afar off. Wow. He doesn't just know your thoughts, he understands your thoughts. You sift and search out my path, my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. There is not a word in my tongue still unuttered, but behold, Lord, you know them all together. Yo, and he still loves us, eh? <laughs> you have beset me, shut me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Your infinite knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high above me and I can't reach it. Listen to this now. Where could I go from your spirit? Where could I flee from your presence? Where could I go from your spirit? Where could I go from your presence? Where could I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the place of the dead, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning or dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me. My goodness, even there your right hand shall hold me. I want you to listen to the impossibility of this. (laughs) But even there you hold me. Even there you lead me. (laughs) Yeah. There's no place that you can go and His presence is not. Right? If, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the night shall be the only light about me. Listen, yeah. Even the darkness hides nothing from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Yeah. You've formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will confess and praise you for who you are. Um, You are fearful and wonderful and for the awful wonder of my birth. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being formed. And then verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed substance and in your book all the days of my life were written before they took shape. Yes, see. <laughs> all the days of my life. In your book, all the days of my life were written before they took shape. And then he says, how precious and how weighty are the thoughts to me, O oh God. To me. How precious are your thoughts? How weighty are your thoughts to me? You know, Psalm 80 says, Lord, what am I? What is man that you are mindful of me? That you, you know, that you think of me? And he goes on to say that you are, you how massive are, you know, your thoughts towards me? You know, to me. And I, I remember going on an airplane going up. And I, I remember if you just go get a higher altitude, all the problems in the world look so small when you go up in the, in the airplane. But all the people start to become nothing. And then as you go up, and I remember going to India and going to evangelize there, to preach there. And while I was about to land, you just see houses all over the place. Goodness. You fly over South Africa, it's like vast land. Now in a place like India, it's just houses and streets and cars all over the place and I'm thinking and he knows each one (laughs) and he he thinks about each one and his thoughts are for each one and they are massive 
I'm thinking, Lord, how is this even possible? You know, um, I've got my hand full of people in my life that I'm able to commit my life to and that when I sleep at night, I think about or... But God thinks about me personally as if it's one, <laughs> as if one person and He sees me individually and He loves me. And just... You guys know that God doesn't love us equally, hey? <laughs> Listen, we think we, He loves us equally, but to, in, to a point, it's true. But there's, there's a misunderstanding that can creep in there. If we are equal, we are replaceable. If we are unique, we are irreplaceable. God loves us uniquely. Each one uniquely. And if we see it in that light, we understand that God can be so committed to you and so in love with the one person, the person that you are. And without, I love you just the same as I love you. If I think about my children, yeah, you could say I love them equally, but it doesn't make sense when I try to love them equally. They, they, they're so precious, each one of them, they're irreplaceable, that I, I've... It's like I've got an individual love for Emma, like I've got an individual love for Lily, and like I've got an individual love for, for Joshua. I love them uniquely. You know, each one's uniquely. And this is amazing about God, is that He can commit to you uniquely, and commit 100% to you, and love you unconditionally. You're irreplaceable. And He manages to be everywhere, at the same time, you're going somewhere, you know, God is not necessarily going with you because He's there already. <laughs> but He's going with you, but He's there already. He's everywhere. How do you explain God? You know, so He says, David says, where can I go from your spirit? Spirit. Thank God that He is spirit. Sometimes we don't realize how important it is that God is spirit. We need God to be spirit. God demonstrated what He looks like in, in human form. And then God was one at one place, in one city, in one town, at one people. But now that He is spirit, thank God, He's everywhere. <laughs> He's here. He's amongst us. He's within us. He's around us. He's everywhere. We need God to be spirit. And God, because He's spirit, He can look at the story of your life in his story because it's written in his book your story is in his book it's not in your book <laughs> it's in his book so your story is in his book and he's looking at that whole story and you can see the beginning to the end and we know that it goes on to eternity we have to understand that god is spirit but it's interesting that he is everywhere if i'm standing here he is here. If I'm standing here, He is here. He's... How do you measure God, you know? How do you see Spirit? Well, another thing that we know that God is, is that God is love. Do you see love? What does love look like? You know, how do you point to someone and say that's love? Eventually, we get to recognize what love is. And you know when someone loves you. You can feel when someone loves you. You understand that someone, to a point you could say that you see love. Yeah. And God is categorizing the same. He is love. He is spirit. That is God. So it was like this morning while we were worshiping, all of a sudden you lose this. I don't know what you, when you fall in love for the first time, it's like you, you can't eat, you can't sleep. If you're talking about the person, you're irritating everyone else because you're only talking about that person. Um, and it's the same thing. And that's why all of a sudden, it's alive all around you. That's God. God is, is, is knowing Him in spirit is the same way. He's, it's alive. It's inside of you. It's around you. It's in your thoughts. And it's, it's real, man. Um, so anyway, so I was thinking... Um, on Friday night at youth, we did this thing about defining God. How do we define God? Define God. 
So each, each one of the kids brought up, okay, God is, one said love, one said life, one said spirit, one said he is peace. Eventually we filled up the whole board full of, full of what God is and how he manifests himself. But this thing about him being omnipresent, Christina, do you want to share that vision? Come, quickly, quickly. This thing about him being everywhere, this is interesting. Um, so Christina shared a vision that she had in the church the other day, and it really blessed me, so I was even going to preach about it today. So come, come share. Don't be shy. Go for it. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So last week, Sunday, in worship, was my off Sunday, so we're not so good beauty. So I was standing there in the middle somewhere, and I was worshiping, and just like close to the end of worship, my eyes were closed. Um, when I opened my eyes, so everybody in my vision that I could see in front and to the side, um, next to each person, I actually saw Jesus standing right next to everybody. Mm. And then I got a revelation which, um, yeah, <laughs> said that God doesn't give a portion of Himself to each one, but He gives you Himself, like all of you. Yeah. It's all present. Yeah. yeah. Amen. That's good. Thank you, Klesina. So He is, what Klesina said, it's, it's really profound. The revelation is accurate. Is that God manages to be everywhere um, and commit to you his fullness to you <laughs> okay so now he's everywhere david says where can i go and your spirit is not then you get a scripture like this that that kind of throws a, a in, in afrikaans you say clip in your boss right um, draw near to god and he will draw near to you yeah. Okay, so now you're everywhere, but now I must draw near to you. Like as if you're far away. Huh? It's interesting. It's like contradictory almost. But he is everywhere. But the point, so we discussed this. I said, okay, but how do we draw near to God? What do you do? He just said, if I go there, you are there. If I even go, go six feet under, you are there. If I go into the deepest parts of the sea, you are there. So how do I draw near to you? Where do I go to draw near to someone who is everywhere? And it always comes down to something that I, that I speak about all the time. Is that all of a sudden, you're conscious of it. You're aware of, of love. It's like you need, to, you need to know, you need to feel it, the spirit around you. We need to draw near to God. We need to draw near to Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, that, that, that is... Um, that's really important. So, yes, yes, I have to share this. Psalm 139, we read it. Listen, listen to this again. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book, all the days of my life were written before they took shape. My goodness. He wrote it. <laughs> Who wrote it? It's his book. He wrote it. He's looking at your life and he looks at the whole thing. He looks at your whole life. Now, come on, show you what kind of book he wrote. So, all the days of your life were written. Okay, go to Psalm 23 quickly. Psalm 23. Read this. Verse 6. Surely, only goodness, mercy, and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life. So God has written this book. <laughs> and He says, this is what I want the story. How about on this page? I'm going to give Him all my mercy, all my love, my loving kindness. Um, Goodness. Yeah, next page. Yeah, let's give him goodness, mercy, and loving kindness. Give him goodness, mercy, and loving kindness. All the days of my life were written in his book. And all the days of my life, goodness, mercy, and loving kindness follows you. From God. 
I don't, it don't matter. I don't care what kind of report you got. If it's a negative report, I want you to know in that, even in that negative report, only goodness, <laughs> mercy, <laughs> and loving kindness follows you. Yes. Only goodness, mercy, and loving kindness follow you. And this is why David said, yes, man, in the worst of it all, you're committed to me. Even in death, you're committed to me. Amen. Sometimes we don't understand that things go wrong for people. And we think, if things are going wrong in my life, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with my relationship um, with God because it's like He's withholding things. It's got nothing to do with that. Read right through the Scriptures. There's not one um, person through all the Scriptures that didn't go through difficult, tough, horrific things. All of them went through horrible trials and tribulations. But God was 100% with them. See, it's not about the reports that you're getting that defines the life of God. The life of God that He gives you is something that comes to you even in the worst of, of things that, that we face. And, and, yeah, so this is important because somehow we, how we deal with these things. When something bad happens, then we, like, we turn from God. When something good happens, then we okay with God again. Yet it's just always He's constantly good. He's good. He's good to you. And um, after we wrote all of the stuff on the board, I asked, okay, so this is everything that God is. So He's amazing. But if you can really think about, if you can put a limit to it, because David says it surpasses knowledge. His goodness surpasses your understanding of goodness. He's his love surpasses your understanding of love. His grace surpasses your understanding of grace. And, and your, all of these things, if you've got a problem with like grace, and love, and God's goodness, it's, it didn't come by revelation of who God is. Amen. It came by something or someone that twisted something about God's nature. But He is good. He's gooder than what you think He is. He loves you. Yeah. Amen. All right. Thank you, Father. So, he speaks. He's different in nature. He's not... He was human being. There is Jesus in heaven, in spirit. But he is spirit. So we must understand that God is different. We got painted the pictures that God is chilling on a, on a, on a, on a chair, on a cloud somewhere. Up somewhere there. It's, it's, the, it's what we need to understand what God is telling us when it says He's on a throne. It means that He's all authority. He's everywhere. He's not on a planet. <laughs> heaven, is, and remember what I say, heaven is not a planet. It's not next to Mars somewhere. It's not on one of the clouds up here. Heaven is not a planet. It's, it's a realm. It's different. It's different in nature. It's everywhere. If it's here, it's here. If I go there, it's there. Okay? It's there. So, um, so, our understanding of God is important. So, now, here's what, here's what I've been thinking about our, our life, right? And the story. All the days of your life were written before you ever were even there in 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 form okay it's there it's written he knows everything about you so when you kick the dog this morning he didn't go oh, why'd you do that he wasn't shocked when you swore he didn't fall off his throne i can't believe my what my my what what my boy did today he he was cursing there or i don't know whatever it is through all the, let's say, let's, we can prove uh, the years of man, maybe 6,000, 7,000 years. Through all that he's endured, and you feel guilty about kicking the dog, or about saying something ugly, he knows it all. <laughs> and this is great, hey? Yeah, yeah, he survived the Romans, right? All of that, and he's still so good. Uh, he's still so good to you. They don't, yeah, they don't mean that he doesn't, that, he, that he's 
cool with sin. It's not the same thing. All right. So I have to, I have to drop this into to my sermon today. But let's go to Genesis chapter 40. And this is going to bless you big time. All right. Genesis chapter 40. All right. God is able to be everywhere. Remember we were in Adamantia, the school, the high school once, and I, was, I wasn't speaking there. I was listening to someone else speak, and he gave a, a chance for questions from the, from the kids. She said, so one girl got up and she said, if God is real, why doesn't he talk back when you ask him stuff? <laughs> you know, where is he? You know, why, why doesn't he... And, and our problem is this thing of spirit, that, that we don't understand spirit, that God speaks in spirit. So God is a spirit, so He speaks in spirit. Yeah. So most often when God speaks, it's dreams, it's visions, it's revelations, it's ideas, it's a voice that comes in in and out. Okay, I'm not saying He doesn't speak audibly. I once heard, twice heard an audible voice, but the majority of the time that God speaks, it just sounds like me. <laughs> and um, in my own thoughts, and then I realized, but this is how God speaks. He speaks like this. So anyways, let's read this Genesis chapter 40. It's a story about Joseph. And this story is, is within one of the most difficult things that Joseph faced as a, as a, as a human being. He gets born and, and he's automatically the favorite amongst the lot. Daddy's favorite, daddy's white bread, um, what we'd say in South Africa. Um, and, then, and then what happens is his brothers get jealous, you know the story. And they start scheming and planning how they can get rid of Joseph. In the meantime, God is giving Joseph dreams. Yeah. I laughed at a friend of mine, he doesn't come to church because every time he comes to church, bad things happen, he says. Things just go wrong in his life. But yeah, God comes and he speaks um, dreams and, and he shows him dreams how, um, you know, um, Joseph in the stars, well, moral of it is he saw Joseph's brothers bowing before, um, bowing before Joseph. And then I said, you think you're better than us? You know? And uh, so the word comes. Isn't it amazing how when the word comes to you, yes, it's awesome. You're going to be the greatest in the world. <laughs> you're going to have so much money. Man, you're so rich. I need your signature. Whatever it is that God says um, He's going to do, that's what He always, He always comes and He gives us incredible word. And then the next thing, what happened to Joseph, is that his brothers sold him to Egypt. Right? His brother sold him to Egypt. He gets, he gets thrown into a pit. The brother's fate is dead. and say they're going to your father. He's dead. So Joseph is dead to his family. And he's on his way to Egypt. How does this word make sense? He's got nothing to do with his brothers anymore. Or whatever. Okay, what are the promises that God has given you? If you line it up with today's situation, you'll probably find that it doesn't match. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Just funny, we've heard the story, but Anya gets a word for her son, and the next day we get a doctor's report that they, they say the ovary is cancerous and they want to cut. <laughs> huh? <laughs> you know, it doesn't, this doesn't add up. Lord, this is what you're saying and what I'm experiencing, it doesn't add up. Yeah. So, um, so let's, so let's check this out. So God comes and He gives Joseph these dreams. And uh, anyways, for years, those things just don't seem like they're taking place. And Joseph ends up in jail. And we're going to start reading from Genesis chapter 40. Verse 1. Now sometime later, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended the Lord. Okay? Their Lord. Egypt's king. And Pharaoh was angry with his officers, the chief of the butlers and the chief of the bakers. He put them in the custody um, in the house of the captain of the guard in prison where Joseph was. 
All right? All right, verse 5. They both dreamed a dream in the same night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream. The butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in this prison. And Joseph came to them in the morning and looked at them. He saw that they were sad and depressed. If I look at your faces today, <laughs> why are you so sad and depressed? All right? He says he saw they were sad and depressed. And he says, um, so the Pharaoh's officers who were in custody with him, um, and they said to him, we have dreamed dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God. I like this. Maybe today you came to church because you need an interpretation. You don't understand why you're going through what you're going through. You don't understand why things are not adding up in your life. You need an interpretation. Maybe you dreamt a dream that doesn't make sense. Then um, we need someone to interpret them. We need someone. So Job 33 explains about the interpreter. If there is an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show to man what is right to God, there must be an interpreter. Yeah, so 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, pray for the power of interpretation. God speaks. He's speaking to you. He's been speaking to you all the time. Maybe you've got a dream that you don't understand. Maybe you've got a word that you don't understand. The point is, you need an interpretation. Alright, so listen to this. He says, um, They said to him, We have dreamed dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams, I pray you. Amazing that Joseph didn't say, I will interpret them. He said, do not dreams, the interpretations belong to God. Yeah. God can make sense of what you're going through right now. He can come and He can give you an answer to why exactly, why are you in this position in your life? Why are you going through what you're going through? So, if you, if you, um, if you, Follow the story. What happens is um, the, 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 the chief butler dreams a dream of, you know, um, there's these birds that come. Uh, no, the baker dreams of that, the, the, the three birds. And the butler um, dreams about the vineyards being, uh, grapes being lifted up. And anyways, what it comes down to is in within three days, the butler would get released from prison and reinstated. And the baker would be killed in three days, all right? So they both got the interpretation of their dreams. But isn't it funny that while you got, while God has given you a dream, He's given you a word, you find yourself in a place of service helping people with their dreams. Joseph had a dream of people bowing down to him. And now he's busy in prison helping people with their dreams. He didn't know. He didn't know that God was busy fulfilling the story. His story. The story that God wanted to do and accomplish in his life. Did you know that God has plans for you? Did you know that God has purpose for you? Did you know that what you're dealing with uh, is not the end? <laughs> Come on, man. I believe, I believe I've seen it. God gets us. And he puts us on top and he makes sense of it. Isn't it funny? So often in our difficult times, we pray out for the hand of God. God, rescue me. God, get me out of this. So often we want an intervention instead of getting an interpretation. God, give me an interpretation. I need an interpretation. Sometimes, why are you there? There's a reason why are you there. Maybe the job that you're working in is not the right job for you and you know it. Why am I here, Father? Have you sent me here? Amen? Come on. Alright. So long story short, um, Joseph gets, um, Joseph gets, tells, tells this, this um, chief butler, he says, okay, you're going to be released, remember me. 
and so he doesn't remember him. <laughs> I think for two years, must be, that he stayed on in prison. A long time. Until Pharaoh dreamed the dream. And he needed an interpreter. Come on. May we be interpreters for, for people. When people come here to this church, I pray that you get interpretation <laughs> from God. Maybe you woke up today, you needed interpretation from God, and God can speak to your heart right now. Yes. We need to be interpreters for people. We need to bring God across to people. We need to show mankind, you know, to demonstrate the love of God. Yes. And um, so two years later, Joseph gets called up, and then he, he, he interprets the dream of, of the Pharaoh. Seven years, seven years, seven years um, abundance. And then the seven years drought. So Egypt gets to plan for this drought in seven years. And as a result, in the drought, Jacob sends out his sons for, for help. And they end up in front of Joseph, needing help. And Joseph stands there. Come, let's check out this in, in Genesis 45. All right, so now, now Joseph's brothers, the guys that sold him and secretly decided to assassinate him, don't forget that Joseph was also falsely accused by um, Potiphar's wife of sexual misconduct. Verse 1, then Joseph could not restrain himself any longer because all those who stood by him and and he called out, Cause every man to go out from me, to get out. So no one stood there with Joseph while he had made himself known to his brothers. Now, think about it. If everybody that betrayed you stood in front of you and you had a place, position of judgment, like Joseph did, <laughs> he had the right to to, you know, give a verdict of, of, of judgment on these people. And he wept and sobbed aloud. Yo! So it triggered all the trauma of the past. And the Egyptians who had just left him heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? His brothers could not reply, for they were distressingly disturbed. At his presence and Joseph said to his brothers come near to me I pray you and they did so he said I am Joseph your brother who you sold into Egypt but now do not be distressed and disheartened or angry because you sold me for God sent me here to preserve life. Wow, sure. This is incredible. So which one is it? Was he sold or was he sent? Was Joseph sold or was he sent? He says, don't, don't be sad. You sold me. But before that even happened, God sent me. Isn't that the most amazing interpretation that Joseph could have got? If Joseph didn't understand that through this whole trial and trauma that he was, was with, he didn't take everything personally and say, ah, look what they did. He took it, he got an interpretation from God. I am here because God sent me here. Maybe you're in the difficult part of your story now. You need an interpretation. Not necessarily an intervention. An interpretation. Why am I here? Why am I here? Why was I sent to this place? There's reason there. You were sent to preserve life. <laughs> There's a story. One day you'll stand at it. So I'm gonna. I want to show you. I want to show you something. Shona, we're gonna use you some. And then we're gonna. All right. So here's God standing in front of Sean. And he says, come to Kimberley. Yes, Kimberley, come to Kimberley. It's 
stop. Where are you? Kimberly. But it just seems like his story is not in the is not fulfilled because he has God again. <laughs> so come, Shona. And it just looks like you're never getting to the, the, the ending of your story. It's never fulfilling. It's Lord, where, where am I? So it's like the whole time he's calling you. And you feel like you're getting nowhere until you, you look back. Look back. And you see... The, thank you, Shona. And you see what you've gained. The progress you've made. And I think so often it's like if I go to, if I'm going to Joburg, when I get to Porch, I'm not tired. Right? You guys know, if you go to Cape Town, when you get to Britstown, you're not tired. Because you know you've got like another, what, like 700 Ks, maybe more, left. But if you're going to Britstown, and you end in Britstown, you're tired. Isn't that funny? It's weird. And I think sometimes God, He calls you to keep you moving. So He says, this is where we're going, come. And then He just goes a bit forward. And when you get there, you feel, okay, I'm not there yet. So we keep moving. So it feels like you're not getting to any conclusion in your story. That you keep facing the same battles until you look back where God's brought you from. <laughs> What you've came out of. Until you stand in front of your brothers and you realize, but God's hand has been in this whole process. Yeah. Ne? I want you to be encouraged. Get an interpretation for what, you, what you're dealing with. Last week we spoke about sing, O barren one. You did not break forth. You know, rejoice. Glad it's because you'll have more children than the one who who's conceived already. Enlarge your tents. Anticipate the breakthrough, the miracle. Stand and be ready. Come on, if you've got breath in your lungs today, just breathe in. You're not done. God's not done. God's not done. He's got a story. He's got something for you to do. As long as you, there's purpose. You can take it a step further. Abraham said, even though his body was as good as dead, there was purpose. Amen? We serve a God that is alive, He's active, He's for you, He's everywhere, in spirit, in nature, He's 100% for you. Amen.